Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our participants in the United States and all around the world. Before we begin our webinar today, and on behalf of everyone involved, we all wish you and your family good health and well being during these uncertain times. We also express our sincere appreciation for all, including some of your family members that are putting themselves on the front lines. Thank you. My name is Hirsch Desai. I am the chair of the American Nuclear Society's Young Members Group. On behalf of the ANS Young Members Group, Clean Energy Ministerial's NICE Future Initiative, and the International Youth Nuclear Congress, or IYNC, I welcome you all to this exciting webinar on microreactors in the near horizon. We have over 1,600 people registered for this webinar. And at, as I speak, we have over 900 people participating. So no pressure to um, all of my colleagues that are presenting today. So before we get started, let me highlight a couple of things. First, the logistics. All of our participants will give remarks eight minutes or so each, lasting a total of 45 minutes or the first half. Tim Crook, who's our YMG executive committee member and also the chair of the program committee, will moderate the questions and answer session for the next 45 minutes or so uh, afterwards. For those that have questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the um, webinar. There's a section uh, titled Q&A. You should be able to submit your questions. We will be compiling those questions and Given the high attendance here, we will try to get through as many as possible. Again, we apologize if we don't go through all the questions, but we will try our best. Everyone that is logged in as a participant is on mute by default. So if you have a question, like I said, please do submit it through the Q&A section below. Next, I want to take a couple of minutes to thank our co-sponsors. First, I want to thank the ANS Young Members Group. This is a consistency of 300 early to mid-career nuclear professionals. At a macro level, YMG enables young professionals to learn inter and interpersonal skills, network with peers among the 10,000 member society, participate in technical and non-technical leadership opportunities, familiarize with governance structure of the society and recognize their peers through awards. YMD sponsors non-technical workshops and meetings that provide professional development and networking opportunities for all young professionals and students. YMG encourages its members to participate in activities of these groups that are closely related to their professional interests and their personal interests, as well as their local uh, American Nuclear Society sections. Young Members Group is also launching a webinar series to provide a spotlight on the national labs with Idaho National Laboratory being highlighted first. The INL Focus webinar will take place on April 15th, 2020. Please keep an eye out for more information on that. Second, I wanna highlight the Clean Energy Ministerial. This is a leading group forum at the ministerial level for clean energy deployment, advocating clean energy actions, innovations, and solutions. The NICE Future uh, initiative, which was formally launched by the CEM, Clean Energy, Clean Energy Ministerial, formally launched just less than two years ago by ministers from United States, Canada, and Japan, and, compromising, and compromises 11 countries, 15 partner organizations, and has engaged exports from, early, from nearly 60 countries. The initiative puts, for the first time, the ministerial spotlight at CEM on nuclear and clean energy systems. Now that that has changed and rightfully so. The NICE Future Initiative envisions a world in which innovative nuclear applications and uses advanced energy, clean energy goals. While the June 2002 to 4, 2020 ministerial in Chile is being delayed due to coronavirus consider, concerns, uh, the new dates are being worked out and will be announced soon. Um, the ministers are searching for an alternative timing and to keep con to continue keep keeping the global focus on clean energy in prominent view. Finally, the third organization I want to highlight is the International Youth Nuclear Congress, or YNC. IYNC. This is a global network of the future generation of professionals in the nuclear field working to develop 
new approaches to communicate benefits of nuclear power as part of a balanced energy mix, promote further peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology for the welfare of mankind, and transfer knowledge from the current generation of leading scientists to the next generation across international boundaries. Thanks to all of these organizations for your efforts. This brings us to why we tuned into webinar today. Today, we will hear about the transformative potential of microreactors and why we see them as game changers for clean energy. Our panel today will cover a range of topics, including their potential applications and what we are doing to bring these microreactors to marketplace. We will start with a keynote speaker from US Department of Energy. This will be Alice Caponetti. She serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Reactor Fleet and Advanced Reactor Deployment in Office of the Nuclear Energy at the US Department of Energy. Her responsibilities include advanced reactor de development activities, including specifically microreactors, innovative nuclear research in advanced modeling and simulation, advanced manufacturing, and advanced sensors and other cross-cutting areas, competitive R&D and infrastructure investment programs, light water reactor programs focused on technical and economic sustainability of the existing US fleet of commercial reactors, and development and deployment of small modular reactors. And finally, uh, her program oversees the much beloved Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear, or GAIN initiative, and the newly launched National Reactor Innovation Center, or the ENRIC initiative. Thank you, Alice, for participating. And with that, let me turn over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm Alice Caponiti from the US Department of Energy. As Hirsch mentioned, we are delighted to present this webinar with the Nice Future Initiative, which successfully pulled nuclear into the Clean Energy Ministerial, and rightly so. Nuclear energy is non-emitting and provides about a third of emissions-free electricity and operates both cleanly and reliably 24-7. And as we see the energy demand grow around the world, um, nuclear energy will play a key role as our global energy mix transitions toward cleaner energy systems. And we see microreactors playing a key role in that future, which is why we're talking about them today. Next slide. While there is no strict definition of microreactors, these are small nuclear reactors that can generate approximately one to 20 megawatts of electricity and provide heat for industrial applications. Microreactors are 100 to 1,000 times smaller than conventional nuclear reactors. While one megawatt electric may not sound like a lot, that is enough to provide reliable, resilient, and clean nuclear-generated electricity to a thousand homes in small and remote communities. Most of these small reactors are designed to be transported nearly fully assembled to an operating location via truck, ship, airplane, or rail car. The Department of Energy believes that microreactors have the potential to provide the commercial and defense sectors with a clean, reliable, and resilient energy supply. The potential benefits offered by microreactors include enhanced inherent safety features, smaller footprints, semi-autonomous and remote control operations that can significantly reduce staffing needs, high temperature operations for both electricity and process heat production, and highly integrated and transportable systems reducing on-site construction time. These attributes are driving the expanding interest in this class of reactors by providing customer choice for non-traditional energy markets, including competitive electricity and process heat supplies for remote and off-grid communities and industrial locations, resilient and energy, reliable energy supplies for remote and forward military bases, reliable and clean electricity supplies for disaster and emergency relief operations, we will hear about a couple of these use cases from our speakers today. Next slide, please. The images that, um, that you'll see shortly are produced by Third Way. They were generated to, to be, depict a number of use cases where small reactors can have a big impact. Starting clockwise from the top left, in remote communities such as Alaska, 
where fuel to run generators is costly to deliver, electricity prices can be up to 16 times higher than the national average and can consume up to half the income of poor households. While the artwork associated with this scenario is rather futuristic, this problem exists today. Arctic communities have already begun to explore the use of small reactors with some that are under two megawatts in size, enough to meet the needs for towns with fewer than 1,000 residents. Next, um, upper right, data from internet servers require a lot of power. About 70 billion kilowatt hours per year or nearly 2% of America's energy consumption. In this data server scenario, one or multiple advanced reactors could completely power a data center, whether it requires two megawatts or 200 megawatts, supplying reliable, consistent energy at competitive costs with zero emissions. Moving to the lower right, a clean transit hub. Transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gases in the United States, surpassing emissions from electric power production. In this scenario, a small reactor provides power to charge the electric vehicles in a park and ride garage, as well as a fleet of buses stored at a nearby depot for recharging every night. And then finally, an industrial hub scenario in the lower left. In the United States, a fifth of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from industrial processes. In this scenario, a high temperature reactor provides 700 degree heat for a chemical processing facility and provides heat to factories within a reasonable distance. So what are we doing to make these scenarios a reality? Next slide, please. At the Department of Energy, we are conducting cross-cutting research and development that directly benefits the advancement and demonstration of microreactor technologies. As part of this program, we are developing experimental infrastructure to support microreactor component design, demonstration, and safety-related testing. We are also collecting experimental data to validate microreactor system performance, and modeling and simulation tools. And because our ultimate goal is to see these technologies launched into the marketplace, we maintain close engagement with the nuclear developer community and with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. DOE recognizes that demonstrations are a vital step toward maturing technologies toward commercialization. That is why we constructed a non-nuclear test bed at Idaho National Laboratory to support non-nuclear demonstrations of a variety of integrated microreactor systems within a prototypical microgrid environment. This test bed will be used to generate validation data for design and licensing cases. Also, the department is standing up the National Reactor Innovation Center, or NREC, led by the Idaho National Laboratory. NREC will offer a range of capabilities to enable the testing and demonstration of reactor concepts by the private sector. You will hear Nick Smith today talk about the various sites being considered at INL to host actual nuclear fuel demonstrations of microreactor concepts. So again, I thank you for joining us and I will now turn us over to our moderator, Tim Cook. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, so I'm Tim Crook. I'm a consultant with MCR Performance Solutions. Uh, we do utility consulting. And then I'm also a Texas A&M Aggie, got two degrees from there. And uh, I'm serving today as the American Nuclear Society Young Members Group Programs Co-Chair. Um, our committee is responsible for all the YMG content at ANS national meetings, as well as digital content like this webinar and the series of webinars we are putting on. Um, so just to remind you, each panelist will chat for about eight minutes, and then we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, as we said before, enter your questions via the Zoom control bar. Uh, I also want to thank my YMG Programs co-chair, Matt Morgan. He is helping uh, assist with the Q&A, which is certainly needed as we have passed 1,000 people who are actually live on this webinar right now. Um, so first, I'll introduce Mark Nickel. He's the Senior Director of New Reactors at the Nuclear Energy Institute. In this role, Mark leads the industry's efforts to improve the regulatory, policy, and small business environment for new reactors. Mark has previously worked for Duke Energy and Toshiba in the areas of used nuclear fuel management operations and new plant projects. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Tim. Um, if we go to my, my second slide.
Thank you. I apologize so I for the, talk the a, slide lag. No problem. I want to talk a, a little bit more about the market opportunities for, for micro reactors. Alex did a great job explaining what a micro reactor is uh, and also uh, generally where, where they could fit. And, and so largely they're, they're in remote markets, but when we look at the micro reactor uh, market opportunities, we divide them into two sides. There's a stationary side, and these are micro reactors that are intended to operate for their entire life in one single location. Uh, and there's the mobile variety, and the mobile means that they can be set up quickly, uh, operated, uh, taken, taken offline and moved offsite quickly, and then set up and, and operated in another location. And you could do that multiple times over the life of, of the reactor. And, and so those, those, while the underlying technology between those two varieties of microreactors is, is very similar or the same, uh, there are going to be things that need to be di designed into the mobile variety um, that the stationary will, will not necessarily need. And so if we look at the stationary market uh, in these remote areas, uh, we have villages, as, as Alice had said, they're, they're currently using diesel generators, very expensive energy because of the, the fuel cost, but especially the transportation of fuel into remote areas uh, is, is very, very expensive. We, we have microgrids, and, and this is uh, something that could be in a, a more urban set, setting, uh, and, and so it could power a micro, small microgrid that provides resilient power uh, it, for backup in, in terms of hospitals, things like that, that need to continue operating if the, the larger grid goes down. Mining operations, uh, are many of them are in remote areas and, and need power and uh, heat. And so the micro reactors can provide both power and heat and, and also defense installations. And I know we have Troy uh, Worschel from DOD that's gonna talk more about that later. On the mobile side, there's, there's two main areas uh, and, and one is in humanitarian and disaster relief. Uh, these micro reactors being small and portable could be taken and set up quickly in, in the event of a, a disaster to restore local power quickly and help help the recovery efforts. And then ground operations uh, again is on on the defense and military side, which which will Troy will cover cover later. Moving on to the next slide. As NEI worked with our members, and there's over a dozen companies developing micro reactors today. And we also worked with potential uh, customers for, for micro reactors. The, the questions we most frequently heard or were asked is number one, when will they be ready? Number two, how much will they cost? And number three, how are we going to get over the, the challenges or barriers to their deployment? So the first uh, thing we did, we, we went out and, and put together a study on the, the roadmap for deployment of micro reactors. And uh, we looked at a couple of things when we looked at the timeline, and that's the, the picture you're looking at here. And what we found is, is that micro reactors can be uh, deployed much more quickly than uh, nuclear reactors have been in the past, or even their, their larger, larger, um, larger cousins. And the reason for that being is, is that they're so small, uh, they're so simple with very few, few components in them. And uh, so, so there's very little information that needs to be, there's very little that needs to be designed, very little information that needs to be uh, reviewed by the, the regulator and then constructing and, and, and building them, uh, manufacturing them uh, can be done much, much quicker. So this was a, our nominal timeline, and, and I'd say it's about seven years, and, and this is in comparison to maybe eight or 10 years for, for a um, grid scale advanced reactor. And we think that there's a lot of opportunity to accelerate this, this schedule. So we, we were a little bit uh, conservative in that uh, and had our, 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 our NRC licensing at three years. We think it can be um, done uh, faster than that for micro reactors and, and even the manufacturing and construction time we think can be uh, done a lot faster. And, and so, so great things are, are happening in, in that area. Well, let's go to the next slide. 
we we also looked this is part of the timeline but with in, in addition to the timeline we looked at what are the challenges uh, that are facing the deployment of, of micro reactors and uh, while the only one that was a, a very difficult barrier to get through is, is the fuel supply, most of the others really just impact the, the timeline uh, for micro reactor developer. They weren't they weren't showstoppers. The the fuel issue is that most of these micro reactors rely on high assay, low enriched uranium. That's uranium enriched up to 20%. It's it's low enriched uranium, so it's not a proliferation concern. Uh, but there is no commercial supply for, for that fuel. And so the, the chicken and egg question is, how do you get the fuel if there's no reactors to use it? How do you build reactors that need the fuel if there's no supply for it? And so the answer is that we need the Department of Energy to, to provide an interim supply and help a, a commercial supply get um, become available. And DOE does have access to, to fuel that, that could be used for, for those purposes. Uh, but nonetheless, this shows up in the timeline, and it, it does represent um, one of the, the longer lead time items for, for the deployment of, of uh, micro reactors. The, the other challenges uh, were, were in the, um, the speed in which industry can develop designs, uh, the speed in which customers are, are able to move and make decisions, and then also uh, the ability to uh, leverage um, leverage the the technology of micro reactors um, to get some streamlining benefits in, in the regulation of them. Going to the next slide. So this, the next thing, question we went to, to answer is the cost of micro reactors. And we, we started out knowing that the, the local uh, price for electricity in remote markets are much higher than, than the grid. And so, so we looked at what is the actual generating cost, and we based this on the fuel cost that also includes the transportation of the fuel. This does not, uh, these, these uh, colored bars that go across with each of the different um, submarkets uh, only represent those costs. They don't represent the sunk capital costs. They don't represent the, the O&M costs. Uh, so it's just the fuel, diesel fuel costs. And, and then we, we estimated the cost of micro reactors. This, this data was, was um, uh, obtained from the developers and, and there, there's a range in cost depending on uh, the type of design and uh, the, the location where it's deployed. So, so that shows up in a range, uh, this, this red, purple, and blue bars. And, and what it shows is obviously the first uh, of a kind is always more expensive, but as you continue to manufacture and build these, the prices come down as you incorporate these lessons learned. And so two, two main conclusions from this. One is that even at the highest uh, expected cost for micro reactors, they are competitive in, in some markets. Um, and they, they're competitive without government support. And there is government support out there. There's production tax credits, loan guarantees that could be used to, to reduce the, the, the first of a kind cost. And the second uh, key conclusion from this is that if we can achieve the lowest expected cost for, for micro reactors, they can be competitive in all markets and, and they even get pretty close to being competitive in the US grid market. And so that's, that's a particularly important as we look longer term into microgrids within the continental United States. Next slide, please. And then the third study we, we looked at and, and put together was how to streamline the, the regulation of micro reactors uh, because we recognize that the, the regulatory pro process that's in place today, while it is, it is um, capable of licensing micro reactors, that's not a concern. Um, it was designed for large light water reactors, a very different technology, and so it's uh, not, not the best suited for, for regulating micro reactors. And we, we evaluated all of the, the particular areas in which microreactors would be regulated and put together our priority list of, of topics. And these were a priority because they're the ones that we felt uh, were most um, needed to be addressed before applications started going into the NRC. And, and just generally, it's the, the re review scope and duration and level of effort um, the, the NRC standard schedule is around 36 months, depending on 
uh, the particular process you use, and, and we felt that microreactors could achieve something less than that. Uh, operator licensing microreactors are planning on using automatic uh, features such that the reactor can essentially adjust power and control and shut down itself without any operator. And so the ability to, to take advantage of that was, was really important. Um, the resident inspector, uh, emergency preparedness, physical security, uh, aircraft impact are, are also with, included in, in those areas. There, there were a couple of issues that were already being addressed or had started to become addressed in, in a broader context of advanced reactors. And, and so we, that siting and environmental reviews where we thought microreactors could, could just fit within those, those existing issues is, is already. And then there were uh, issues that would be, need to be addressed sometime in the future. They just weren't urgent and that's the transportation, uh, specifically if you're gonna transport a microreactor with fuel loaded in it, um, some, some companies are planning that, other companies are not. Uh, annual licensing fees, the, the fuel qualification, because this gets to the fuel timeline that I mentioned earlier, and a couple of others. And so um, we've shared that report with the NRC, and, and um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that, that uh, we can make some progress on that. The, the other thing I'll mention within the regulatory uh, space is that uh, there is a microreactor company that has submitted an application to the NRC. Uh, that company is Oklo. They submitted a uh, combined operating license uh, last week to, to the NRC. And, and so that's very encouraging and, and we look forward to, to watching that, that application go through the process. And uh, next slide. That was the last slide that I had for you. Okay, back, back to you, Tim, thank you. Thank you again, Mark. Um, so next we'll have Troy Warshall. Troy is a Director of Operational Energy Resilience in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Sustainment at the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, after retiring from the United States Marine Corps in 2011, Mr. Warshall managed a $1.8 billion budget for the Army's counter IED division until 2013. From 2013 until the present, he has led the op Operational Energy Resilience Division. Since coming into the Energy Office, he has led reform and energy use for deployed forces, drove change in the military planning process to realistically consider energy implications, and championed training and education, and now leads the DoD effort for shore-based nuclear power. Thank you, Troy. Well, thanks everybody, and I appreciate you having me on the call. Uh, really excited to see the, the number of participants continuing to climb. Uh, as we're hitting 1,050 as, as I speak. So you, ask, you may ask yourself, uh, you know, why DOD and, and nuclear power? Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a background, uh, you know, obviously we're very sensitive in the Department of Defense to uh, what the administration feels are its priorities. And this administration has, has placed specific emphasis on the fact that they want to revitalize the nuclear power industry. Now. That being said, um, if you have not had the opportunity to read the unclassified version of the National Defense Strategy, I, I would highly recommend that you do that. But what that does is characterize how the department sees the current status of the world and how do we need to posture ourselves in order to be able to, to meet the threats that we're facing. Now, uh, some of the other folks that you'll, you'll hear on this call are, are very deep in nuclear power, understand all the, the nuances of it. Uh, like Tim said, I'm a knuckle dragon Marine. So, you know, I've, I've got uh, one thought in mind and it's the thought of the department. And that mission is to kill bad guys and break their toys. So as I'm looking at nuclear power, the thought is how does that help, uh, help my mission? And quite frankly, we're agnostic to, to power source. Uh, the Department of Defense consumes a massive amount of, of liquid fuel, mostly in the form of jet fuel, uh, about $18 billion a year. 75% uh, of that is, is fuel that's used to move, train, and fight the forces. And if there are options that we can use to look to reduce that liquid fuel consumption, uh, you know, and with that, the associated convoys, uh, risk to, to life and limb, uh, risk to mission, all those sort of things, we're very interested in doing that. Combine that with the fact that uh, as we are uh, 
as we're looking to our future, we're anticipating our energy demands are going to continue to climb. One can imagine if you're looking at uh, directed energy weapons, laser, anything like that, the power requirement for that is going to be substantially higher than, than uh, what we currently use. And nuclear power seems to be one of those, uh, one of those opportunities. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice I keep tying this back to, to the threats we face. Uh, you know, obviously we've had a, we've, we've been in, in combat for the last decade plus. Uh, we've got very smart adversaries and they've been watching our, how we fight and learning lessons from that. From that, they've adapted their doctrine. They understand that uh, they don't want to take U.S. fighting forces head on. It's much better to uh, to look at the logistics side, and if they can if they can stop our ability to to move energy, that then stops our ability to project power. So, uh, and we also operate in an all hazards environment. So, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, you know, pick your natural disaster, we still have to continue to operate, uh, and. You know, there's the potential for micro reactors to help reduce that risk that we're facing. And we understand as we try and project power that the that we're very reliant on a very uh, or on a potentially fragile civilian electric grid. You know, we when we get called to to do our job, we have to do it no matter what. Doesn't matter uh, climate condition uh, attack. We have to be able to project power and and get our forces moving. So, you know, as we look at the ability to enhance our resilience, microreactors are, again, another very uh, attractive opportunity, uh, should all the technology bear out, to be able to enhance that resilience. And then, uh, you know, as, as Mark mentioned, it's one of those things that's very well suited towards uh, operation in remote locations. You know, we talked about uh, two different efforts that are ongoing in the department, Department of Defense right now. One is led by the Strategic Capabilities Office, which is looking to develop that, that first mobile micro reactor. Uh, the, there's a lot of question, uh, you know, as we're doing this, you know, how do, you know, how do we use it? How do we deploy it? How do we man, train, and equip for it? And all those things are questions that we're, we're we are answering while the Strategic Capabilities Office is looking to develop this first of a kind. Uh, they recently awarded a, a contract to three vendors, uh, Westinghouse, X Energy, and BWXT, for uh, design, uh, you know, advanced design uh, and drawings, uh, so they can do the engineering evaluation, and then determine uh, what happens in in the next phase to build uh, the first reactor. The other effort that's ongoing in the department, and uh, and Mark mentioned it, was the uh, the fixed base reactors. Typically, on military bases, uh, we have critical loads that need to be powered, and if we can take those off the grid, uh, put those on on nuclear power, and then use the commercial electric grid as our backup, you now we've enhanced our resilience capability significantly. Uh, you know, we understand that the most of the the important load probably between 10 and 15 megawatts and after talking with reactor companies we believe we'll be able to daisy chain multiples of these together to be able to meet the requirements that we have for uh, for power and stuff on our bases and obviously we're looking at load shedding and, and things like that because the uh, you know the bowling alley necessarily isn't uh, something that needs to be powered in time of crisis but the operations center might be so how do we you know how do we make smart energy decisions and then uh, ensure that we can power those things to be able to project power and meet the mission that we require. And then finally, uh, we are we're working closely with with Department of Energy, uh, keeping an eye on industry. Uh, you may have heard of Section 327 of the FY19 uh, National Defense Authorization Act that uh, that looks to do a demonstration project uh, between DOE and DOD. Uh, to enhance energy resilience on a domestic military base. And we are, uh, we are on track to meet the, the 2027 goal. We think, in fact, that we're going to be able to, to beat that. So a uh, very exciting time in, in the department. And I, I really look forward to, uh, to more discussion uh, with this group and uh, everybody online. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop here and turn it back to you, Tim. Thank you, Troy.
Um, our next panelist will be uh, Key Zemer. Um, Key's the project manager for SMR deployment, and in Canada that includes microreactors and classification at the Canadian National Laboratories. Uh, Key brings over 30 years of experience in leadership, project management, engineering, R&D, operations, construction, and business management in the nuclear industry, including several mega ETC projects, equipment design and fabrication, and the first of a kind engineering and construction. Uh, prior to his current position at CNL, Dr. Nimmer was the Senior Vice President at SNC uh, Lavalin slash Adkins, where he was responsible for U.S. commercial and Asia-Pacific business. Before joining Adkins, he was Vice President of Operations and Project Management for the BWXT Nuclear Energy and Technology Services Business Unit. Dr. Nimmer has also worked at CBNI Module Program and at Duke Energy. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, there we go. So just uh, just to give everyone a little bit of information about uh, uh, CNL, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, uh, I'm sure everyone knows who all the DOE sites are in the U.S., but just to give you a quick information about CNL, we're made up of several different uh, facilities and locations in Canada. Our largest is Chalk River Laboratory. Uh, it's the single largest science and technology laboratory in Canada. Um, we have over 9,100 acres of land with uh, 200 acres of uh, lab complex. We have uh, 17 different nuclear facilities. We have 2,800 uh, employees with over 500 PhDs and masters and 1,600 engineering and scientific staff. Uh, similar to DOE facilities, we are looking at advanced nuclear fuels and materials research, radiobiology, radioecology, hydrogen and hydrogen isotope management, nuclear safety risks and security risk management, uh, nuclear and systems engineering, and nuclear chemistry applications. And we've had numerous uh, nuclear reactors on our site over our years uh, since, uh, since the 40s. Uh, next slide, please. So in uh, Canada, when we talk about uh, SMRs, that includes uh, the microreactors. We basically, in Canada, we look at uh, SMRs as in uh, three streams. Um, uh, so we look at the larger on-grid applications to uh, take place by the 2020s. We're looking at advanced technology streams of advanced, which would include advanced fuel utilization in the 2030s. And then stream three, which is what this call and webinar is about today, is the microreactors. And these are really the off-grid uh, reactors, as um, Alice mentioned earlier, uh, the low, less than 40 megawatt type reactors. And as we look at the Canadian market, we have quite a need for, for all the different streams, but in particular, these microreactors. As we look at northern Canada, there are over 200 communities that are largely indigenous and they're reliant on diesel generation where they can only get diesel fuel into these remote communities two or three months a year. We also have uh, a very large uh, resource extraction needs in Canada for hydrogen production as well as power for uh, surface extraction and, and mining. Um, and then of course we have uh, uh, we're, Canada, we're committed to uh, addressing climate change and action against climate change. And these microreactors in both the northern communities and the resource extraction needs, as well as the young grid SMRs, will help, help us meet those needs. Also, as far as Canada, to, to looking at this, um, we have Canada put together a uh, uh, SMR roadmap for deploying SMRs in Canada, and that was a joint combination from the government of Canada as well as industry, and that was released in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. So at CNL, we recognized back in 2016 that uh, there was quite a bit of interest both in Canada and internationally in SMRs. Uh, so we put together a vision. Well, first we uh, we performed a market survey in 2017, and we wanted to understand what the uh, needs and opportunities for SMRs in Canada were. And coming out of that market survey, we put together a, a vision for CNL, where we wanted to demonstrate a commercial viability of an SMR by 2026. We wanted to be recognized as a global leader in SMR prototype and testing. We also wanted to be recognized as a hub where multiple SMR 
and microreactor vendors could come build and test their and demonstrate their reactors. And last but not least, we wanted to host a uh, demonstration project by 2026. So in 2018, we uh, initiated a four-stage process to host a demonstration reactor at, at our CNL facilities, either Chalk River, which is I mentioned is in Ontario, or our White Shell facility, which is in um, Manitoba, which is in the middle of Canada, uh, center province of Canada, above uh, North Dakota. Um, and um, so we put together a four-stage process, um, which the first stage is really a pre-qualification stage, and then a due diligence stage, then a negotiate stage three would be a negotiation of land use, and stage four would be the actual project execution. Now at CNL, we're, we want to host the site and provide the, the land available as well as help with the R&D to support the different technologies. We believe that particularly for the microreactors, it's extremely important for, uh, at least for in Canada, for a microreactor to be able to, to build and demonstrate a reactor because many of the remote uh, communities as well as your resource and uh, extraction and mining companies would also want to see a microreactor built and demonstrated before they would want to see it uh, deployed at a remote community or a mining or resource extraction location. So to date we've had, uh, uh, sorry, there we go. to date we've had uh, three uh, technologies who have passed our uh, stage one, which is U battery, battery terrestrial energy, and star core. And we have one proponent which has passed both stage one and stage two, and they're currently in stage three of our process, and that's Global First Power. And Global First Power is um, really, um, there have been numerous uh, vendors that have submitted to the uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission as part of the VDR uh, vendor design review process, but only one has actually submitted a license application. And Global First submitted their license application to prepare site back in uh, March of 2019. So uh, they're the, uh, the furthest along in the uh, licensing application in Canada. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to our uh, our uh, deployment work, we're also at, at CNL. We're also have several research initiatives. Uh, one is the Canadian Nuclear Research Initiative, and that is a, a program to support collaborative research of uh, SMRs and microreactors with uh, with uh, CNL. And the goal of the program is to accelerate the deployment of the safe, clean, and secure. Uh, uh, technologies in Canada. Uh, we have numerous um, technology themes of this scenery uh, initiative, which include uh, feasibility studies, licensing and safety analysis, uh, reactor physics, economics, SMR component degradation, thermohydraulics. Uh, we had our first intake back in late 2019, uh, and um, we ha have uh, chosen four of those projects that we're uh, currently proceeding with and uh, looking to kick off in uh, this, uh, this calendar year in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. The, the other um, activity that we have going on at CNL is a, uh, related to advanced reactors and uh, microreactors is our clean energy development and innovation research park. It's a clean energy park where we're trying to uh, couple microreactors in, co in coordination with renewables, a smart grid energy storage, and multiple energy applications such as hydrogen reduction, uh, transportation, desalinization, uh, resource extraction, district heating, uh, greenhouse uh, growing, et cetera. And we wanna provide both a demonstration platform as well as enable low carbon systems to be coupled with uh, microreactors and provide the uh, prototype for these uh, diverse applications. So um, that's it for my slides. I appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, our last panelist will be Nick Smith. Nick is the Deputy Director of the National Reactor Innovation Center at the Idaho National Laboratory. In this role, he's responsible for supporting initiatives to provide resources to reactor innovators to test, demonstrate, 
and conduct performance assessments to accelerate the, the deployment of advanced nuclear technology concepts. Nick was most recently with the Generation 4 Nuclear Reactor R&D Program Manager at Southern Company Services. In this role, he is responsible for highly leveraged collaboration with other reactor designers, national labs, influencing policymakers, and early engagement with regulators. He's worked on various aspects of micro-reactor R&D, demonstration, and deployment efforts. He's also played professional football for the New York Jets. Nick? Thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, we can go to the next slide here. So, the, uh, the National Reactor Innovation Center was launched in August of last year. Um, and Ashley Finan is the director, and I am the deputy director. So we're still relatively new in the seat, but we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pipe. Um, you know, INRIC was created with a very clear and focused objective, uh, which is exciting because we get to enable the test and demonstration of advanced reactor concepts. So the National Reactor Innovation Center is led by INL, but we are coordinating and working with other labs and DOE sites around the country. Um, and the, the goal here is, is it very specific to get these demonstration reactors online, and that can involve providing site access permits, uh, fuel production support, uh, support with regulatory, a number of different things that enable these demonstrations. Next slide. So there's really three key aspects to the INRIC mission, and that is to inspire the global community, to empower our stakeholders, and to deliver successful demonstration reactor projects. Um, next slide. So, oh. That one, yeah. <laughs> so the first few things that we have been working on here um, really revolve around kind of the the staffing and strategic planning to get NREC up and running. Um, we are hiring right now. We've got a few job postings out, and we're looking for you know technical project leads, program managers, uh, communications folks. We we need a we need a wide uh, range of different people to help us out right now. But uh, we're also doing a lot of planning to, to enable these projects that are gonna be designed with teams that are in separate geographic locations in some cases. Uh, you've gotta be able to collaborate and get people on site with ease. Um, we need you know, alignment and optimized efforts so that we can get you know, very specific missions accomplished there. Uh, we're working with a lot of different industry partners right now, and they're all pursuing different types of reactors. They're looking at different licensing pathways. They're different size machines, different fuel forms. Um, and we're, we're trying to find out what the best ways are to enable as many of those as possible um, so that we can do these reactors routinely. Um, and part of that is addressing fuel transportation, how are we gonna dispose of the spent fuel at the end of a demonstration? And how do you decommission these reactors once they've uh, run their course? Next slide. So one of the really exciting things that I wanted to bring up here is this idea we have for a demonstration reactor test bed. So you can think about this as a facility that has some permanent test bed systems like the containment for a reactor and doors to get equipment in and out and uh, cranes, life safety systems like fire protection, radiation monitoring, um, a control room that's some sort of standardized, all the utilities associated with it. And then the reactor developer would bring in their you know small machine that was maybe built offsite somewhere. It you know, has to have the appropriate QA paper trail, but you would bring that into the test bed, operate it for three to six months, get some data, uh, basically look at some transients, maybe look at some design basis accidents, and then uh, wrap it up and pull it out of the cell and then bring in another reactor and do that again. And so this is a really exciting way that we could get to a, a routine cadence of doing demonstration reactors uh, at INL or uh, other sites. Next slide. So 
The EBR2 dome at INL is one of the uh, leading contenders as a demonstration reactor testbed site. So you can think about this one as the dome is a foot thick concrete rebar reinforced with steel plating on the outside. Uh, so it would act as a safety significant containment structure. We can do safeguards category two fuels there. So basically HALU or LEU, uh, less than 20% enriched fuels here. Um, there's a break point in the DOE authorization uh, space at 20 megawatts. So this, this facility would be good for machines that were less than 20 megawatts. Right now we're leaning towards uh, a 10 megawatt heat rejection system for the, the dome because it seems like it would capture most of the micro reactor concepts that we're seeing. Uh, we're designing it so that it would be able to accept a Connex box, a standard Connex box, so eight feet by eight and a half feet. Um, there's some repairs that need to take place. Uh, the crane that's inside the cell right now, or the dome right now has to be repaired. Um, there's new penetrations that are gonna be needed for stuff like communications and utilities. Um, and then we also are gonna have to add some security systems and things like fire protection and radiation monitoring. Uh, next slide. So the other location that we're looking at is uh, the former zero power physics reactor cell, zipper cell, that's at the materials and fuels complex at INL. So we actually have started a preconceptual design effort to look at how this facility would be used as a test bed. Um, and we're working with industry to define the requirements for this facility. So it is a safeguards category one facility. It would be able to accept reactors that have highly enriched uranium fuel forms or plutonium fuel forms. Uh, it's got, we're thinking that this would be for very small systems, like 500 kilowatts or less thermal. Uh, it could be uprated, but there's some improvements needed to like the roof. Uh, it also would need fire protection, radiation monitoring. But the, the interesting thing about this is that you can go to a very small scale and verify physics, conduct cr critical experiments before scaling a reactor concept up uh, for commercialization with a, a lower enriched form of fuel. And so it could be potential to save a lot of money and increase the speed to demonstration for a lot of concepts. Next slide. Um, and then there's some other activities that we have going on around risk reduction of using the DOE authorization pathway for these demonstration reactors. So uh, we're thinking about it in terms of if you have a TRL2 concept and you want to bring it up to TRL6 before you go to NRC to try and commercialize it, the, these test beds and, and running them at a DOE site could be a great way to do that. And there's a DOE pathway to authorize these machines that could potentially be faster and simpler for more experimental technologies. Um, we're also looking at uh, how we can go ahead and start the NEPA process and, and shorten the time scale for getting the NEPA records of decision to operate these reactors by using uh, enveloped generic reactor characteristics and then being able to do you know, a, a modification to that NEPA based on a specific reactor as long as it fits inside that envelope. Um, we are preparing fuel production infrastructure. So if you have a reactor concept that's not you know, a commercially available fuel form or it's something unique that you, know, you only need a few kgs of it to do some experiments or a hundred kgs for your first reactor, well, we wanna be able to do that and then work through the, the kinks on how you produce the fuel and allow it to go to maybe an engineering or a, a commercial scale up from there. Uh, and then another interesting thing that we're trying to provide is uh, satellite office space for collaboration on site. Uh, there's something about being on the site out in the desert and you know being close to where the actual construction is happening, that it makes a big difference. And if we're gonna have efficient collaborations with industry, we need to be able to uh, set them up so they can work uh, alongside us. So it's uh, really exciting stuff going on there. Next slide. 
so just to wrap up on this, we've done this before. We built 52 reactors out in the desert in Idaho, and it's not something that's impossible. Uh, we're going to do it again. The momentum is here, the resources, the interest, the, the, the all the focus is there, and it's exciting times to be in nuclear. Uh, this is the most exciting thing I've ever been a part of. So I appreciate y'all giving me the opportunity to present. I'll uh, hand it back over to Tim. Thank you, Nick. Cool stuff. Um, so we're going to do a question and answer session. I've got questions that have been sent in. Thank you all for sending all these questions in. There were, I think, 120 questions that our team has processed. Um, they've ranked them based on kind of the number of times people ask them. So the first question I have is for all panelists. What I'm going to go ahead and do is unmute all of y'all. Um, so just unmute all the panelists unless your phone is is muted. Um, but the, the first question is, what are the pros and cons of micro reactors versus SMRs? Well, this well, is Mark Troy, Nickel from, from, from NEI. Uh, so, so, so SMR. Go ahead, Troy. We're going to appreciate it from okay. our point of view. Um, um, keep in mind that we're in size. SMRs are both in this the category. Uh, Troy, just a second. Let's have uh, Marcus go first. Are, are all advanced reactors. So, so they all share similar uh, uh, advantages in terms of improved performance, simplicity, uh, which translates into better economics and and uh, those sorts of things. So the the key difference between micro reactor and SMR is in the intended market. Micro reactors are most good for remote markets because of their size and simplicity. <clears throat> SMRs would not be a good fit just because they're too large. Um, on the other hand, SMRs we expect to to be lower cost just because of the uh, cost advantages of, of that, that size reactor. And so they're a better fit in the uh, continental grid market where cost competitiveness is, is much more uh, much more critical. Um, next to Troy. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, um, you know, I think for us, oh, the uh, you know, DOD is not in the, in the business of certainly producing power. Okay. Can you guys hear? Okay. So what I'll say is, uh, you know, DOD is not. Hey, Troy, the, it, it seems a little laggy. Of producing power. Okay. So what we're trying to do. Okay. DOD is not in the business of uh, producing power. So what we're trying to do is size the uh, reactor requirement to our uh, to our need. And then uh, you know use much of that power to win on base. So you know I think uh, reactors make a lot of you know, for us uh, SMR at least from a military perspective. Over. And uh, I would just add to what uh, Mark and Troy said. This is keys is that. Uh, the, the micro reactors should be able to build more of the micro reactors in a factory, and they should be uh, more transportable than the larger uh, on grid SMRs. Thanks for those responses, y'all. Um, so, our next question Given this new interest in feasibility and new nuclear, what is the NRC doing to accelerate the review of micro reactors and non LWR design? And I, I think maybe. Yeah, this is Mark Nickel. I'll, I'll start with that. So, so the NRC has been very uh, proactive in looking at their regulations and uh, in preparing for applications of advanced reactors. The first thing they did is to assess their readiness and capability of, of reviewing an advanced reactor application. And this began several years earlier. And they concluded that, yes, the current regulations were adequate. They 
can review advanced reactor and micro reactor applications. But they also identified that there are opportunities to improve on their, their regulations to better match with these technologies. And since then have been um, working toward addressing specific topics. So emergency preparedness is one of the first ones that they've looked at and, and they have rulemaking ongoing for that. Uh, they've looked at physical security. More recently, they're looking at, at issues like environmental um, review uh, and reviews to, to make those more streamlined. There's a long, long list of, of issues that they've been, been looking at, um, and they're all on the website. They have a very good website to, uh, to find this information. Do you, you want to add anything, Nick? Um, yeah, I would just say that, you know, we are, NREC is right now in an early engagement discussion with NRC on how we best uh, transfer lessons learned and knowledge that's gained from these demonstration reactor projects. Um, and we have some ideas and some of it involves, you know, getting NRC engaged even in a deeper level with these demonstrations that are running through uh, the DOE authorization process uh, and allowing them to participate actively rather than just watch in, in the process. So I don't have anything I can you know, pin down today but we are definitely engaged with them, and it's an important topic because there should be a uh, a reasonably obvious path from you know total conceptual design that's never been built before in the world through this early demonstration through the DOE authorization and into a a commercial licensing paradigm that's uh, based on the data that you would have assumed that you would have collect on along, along the way. And if I could just add um, the, uh, yeah. if I could just add to that, the, in addition to uh, what's already been said, the the NRC and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission last year signed an MOU, where, and they don't haven't quite worked out exactly how it's going to work yet, but the the premise is that um, a lot of these micro reactors would be licensed in both the U.S. and Canada and and el elsewhere in the world. And the goal is ultimately to be able to uh, not duplicate efforts uh, as far as reviewing this, the technologies in, in both Canada and the U.S. And once again, that has to be worked out through the details, but ultimately the, the goal is to be able to not, not necessarily share, but uh, take advantage of work that's already been performed in one country by one regulatory agency and not repeating that same analysis in the other country. Thanks for that perspective on the Canadian regulatory as well. Um, for our next question, could the panel talk a bit about potential types of fuel and coolant forms that are being looked at for microreactors? So leaning in a little bit more of a technical direction, maybe Nick, you'd like to start with this one? Um, yeah, sure, sorry, could you repeat that? It broke up a little bit on my end. What are the potential fuel and coolant forms that are being looked at for microreactors and how they differ oh, from every traditional reactors? Uh, the majority of concepts that we're seeing right now are triso fueled. Uh, there's a big chunk that are kind of metallic fuel, uranium, uh, sodium fast reactor uh, designs. There's a lot of molten salt reactors. The vast majority of those would be fluoride salts with uh, you know graphite moderator, and then there's a handful of chloride salt, fast spectrum, molten salt reactors. Um, so it's it's really in those buckets for the most part. Triso fueled, the molten salt cooled, triso fueled, HTGRs, and then the sodium fast reactors, and then the liquid fueled MSRs. And I saw a question, I'll just add one more thing. I saw a question about thorium and whether or not uh, that was being evaluated. So you, you can't use thorium to run a reactor directly, right? It thorium breeds into uranium-233. And so whatever pathway you use, uh, you gotta start with, you're gonna burn a uranium isotope to create the fission. Uh, the test bed concept that we're looking at for the zipper cell would be capable of operating U-233 or thorium originating reactors. I think that really covers it, shows the diversity of, of application. 
Um, Mark, here's a question maybe for you, uh, and, and also maybe keys for, for the Canadian approach. How can microreactors provide flexibility in electricity demand? Can microreactors also help with microgrids? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so first, microreactors can produce can can produce usable heat in addition to to electricity, um, and so this this is part of their flexibility uh, as demand increases or, or falls, or if you are integrated with renewables or, or storage technologies, um, you can continue to operate at 100% power and you can shift your, your energy product from electricity to heat. Uh, that heat could be used for district heating of homes, businesses. It could be used for uh, directly in storage itself, or it could be used to, to generate hydrogen or industrial processes. Uh, and so you ha it, it gives you that flexibility to alter your energy product based on, on momentary demands, uh, but also be able to operate at continue operating at, at 100% uh, per, percent power. Do you want yeah, to uh, I, no, I think Mark pretty much covered it. Okay, well, well, sort of building on that, and this might be an opportunity for Alice to jump in, but let's start with keys. Um, for communities, particularly indigenous or Aboriginal communities, but obviously not limited to them, they could benefit greatly from microreactors, but has there already been outreach that has happened with these communities to find out their interest levels? Um, this is both a, a Canadian and U.S. community outreach question, and, and, and we'd like to see the differences in your approach. Um, so in Canada, I, I can't speak to the U.S., but uh, for Canada, there. Uh, we are going through a, quite a significant outreach in certain areas. In fact, um, one of the communities outside of our White Shell facility, which is uh, in, in Manitoba, uh, that community, uh, um, Penawa, has basically asked, you know, and they, they would like to see a microreactor built at, at our White Shell site. And uh, they are offering their community, because they're kind of the end of the uh, the line as far as electricity lines go. So they're trying to to demonstrate uh, to the other communities in Canada and the remote communities in particular, the value and, and so they could come and put their hands on it and see how it will work in a, a small environment. Uh, we, and then we do have through, um, through different vendors, they've already started going out and, and speaking in different uh, venues uh, to try to have that outreach and have the opportunity to um, to answer questions as well as to you know describe the benefits of of their technologies. Alice, would you like I to comment that. on some of the approach? Sure. Um, part of what we've done in our funded microreactor program is is support some of these studies, looking at techno economic analyses for microreactors to to meet market needs in various areas. So um, we've, we've supported some studies regionally. Um, we've got one underway looking at the Northwest United States. We supported a study looking at microreactor applications in um, Puerto Rico, um, looking at the potential for small reactors to support um, microgrids there. Um, so, so that study is gonna be available soon. And we we have a competitive um, cost shared opportunity where people can apply to to have studies fund, studies funded through those vehicles as well, and um, some of our funding opportunities can be found at the Gain website at um, www.gain.inl.gov under the funding opportunities tab. Um, we provide opportunities to fund studies of these sorts. Thank you, Alice. Um, for our next question, we'll start with, uh, th this could be to uh, Mark probably first. Um, how does the provided development timeline change between first of a kind and nth of a kind? Um, and also you might want to explain that, that difference in concept. Also, how many successful builds are needed to go from first of a kind to nth of a kind costs? Yeah, so first of a kind is, is as it sounds, it's the very first unit that, that you produce. Nth of a kind is a concept that as you build, uh, as, as you continue to build the same design over and over and over again, 
you learn lessons that you translate from one build to the next build. And as you learn those lessons and translate them, you help to reduce the cost and, and schedule. And so eventually you get to an nth of a kind, which is sort of a steady state where you're, you're not seeing a lot of reductions in cost and, and schedule anymore. Um, typically what you see is uh, some percentage of reduction in, in cost and schedule, every doubling of, of units that, that are produced. And so uh, we, didn't, we didn't look specifically at the nth of a kind schedule and what it would be. Uh, but based on, on that roughly seven-year schedule that I, I laid out in, in the presentation, I, I would imagine we could we could easily shave off uh, three years or so uh, in, in getting to that nth of kind. Some of that is going to depend on uh, not just these lessons learned in, in manufacturing and getting these in factories. It's going to depend on the, the fuel supply and getting this commercial supply of, of HALU fuel. And it's also going to depend on uh, getting some streamlining efficiencies in the, the regulatory um, processes as well. Did anybody want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, the next question, um, and we'll start maybe with Alice on this one. Uh, is there a reason, uh, well, so Mark listed spent fuel as, or did not list spent fuel as one of the issues. Um, would this issue not need to be addressed before someone could purchase a reactor? So how does spent fuel play into all of this? Um, certainly the fuel cycle is going to be an important part of, of, of a, a reactor um, economic case. For NRC licensed reactors, and this is where I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that for NRC licensed reactors, um, we do have a standard spent fuel um, contract where spent fuel from com commercially licensed reactors would be part of that overall um, spent fuel pathway. That being said, we're constantly doing research and development on um, the entire fuel cycle technology um, portfolio for these new fuels being looked at. So that is part of the research and development we're doing to support development of innovative technologies. Mark, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so I didn't list it as as an issue uh, because the as as Alice said, there are there are pathways for for the disposal um, it, that are safe and technically sound. We we do get questions about what what will happen with the used fuel for for micro reactors, and micro reactors have uh, some options available to them that that the larger ones don't. The, the first thing to point out is that the fuel is going to, the, the reactor will operate with the same fuel for 10 years or, or longer in many cases. And so it's a very, very long period of time before you have to take that fuel out. Many of the developers are um, conceiving that it, these would essentially be like batteries where after the, the period of 10 to 20 years of operations, you would take that reactor and fuel away. You'd You'd, in its place, you'd put a new reactor and fuel. And so with the used fuel, you could, one of the options is you could take it to a central facility, remove the fuel there, store it safely, and then you could refurbish the, the other reactor parts and then reuse them for, for another location. Great, thanks. Question for Troy. Does the DOD envision following a path of development similar to that performed for naval reactors? And will the DOD require micro reactors to be licensed by the NRC, DOE, and or DOD? So how does, how does licensing play to that? And last, are you on your schedule for 2027 or sooner? No, great question. Uh, so to answer the last part first, yes, we are on schedule. Uh, it looks like we're gonna be able to easily meet and potentially exceed the, uh, the 2027 timeline. Uh, going back to the, to your first questions, uh, for the, uh, stationary reactor, we're looking for an NRC licensed unit. Like I said, I don't necessarily want to, uh, I don't necessarily want to own and operate for a, uh, for a fixed base. I'm more interested in doing a power purchase agreement. Uh, again, that's because I, I'm not really in the business of, of, Generating power, that's not my core mission. So we're let the, the smart folks that really know how to do that, do that and we'll just buy the power. For the, uh, for the mobile reactor, uh, currently they're looking at a 
DUE license. Um, however, everybody's working closely with the NRC so that uh, the mobile reactor could be NRC licensed to bowl. That, uh, you know, that'll be up to the company who, whoever wins the award and develops that reactor to, to go down that path. But that was one of the things that we stressed was we wanted it to be licensable for the, for an NRC product. Over. Thanks, Troy. Um, another question from a professor. Uh, how can universities in the U.S. and Canada support microreactor development? Um, maybe let's start with Alice for this one. Yeah, um, with the Department of Energy, for our research and development lines, we set aside up to 20% of our R&D budget to support research at universities, and we have some other um, funding areas where universities compete. But specifically for microreactors, we, um, we establish scopes of work for universities to apply to. Um, that's an annual funding process, and information about that funding opportunity can also be found at the GAIN website under funding opportunities. Keys, would you like to add anything from the Canadian perspective? Uh, uh, sure, and uh, similar to uh, the US uh, CNL, we have numerous collaborations with universities in Canada, uh, and in particular, um, the New Brunswick Initiative, where there has formed a, uh, a, a consortium between, um, maybe a consortium is not the right word, but they formed an alliance between uh, New Brunswick Power, some local universities, and also um, two um, SMR developers in, in the New Brunswick area of Canada. And uh, CNL is also involved in part of that. So there's a lot of research that will be going through that uh, research initiative at uh, New Brunswick uh, University. And, and um, so that's one example as well as I said, other uh, collaborations that CNL has with universities throughout Canada. Thanks. Um, Nick, question for you. What are the criteria that you plan to use to select which specific reactor designs will be selected to demonstrate at NREC? Also, can you explain a little bit more about the DOE authorization, how the DOE authorization pathway will be shorter than NRC? Sure. So uh, the NREC facilities, the test bed facilities that we're talking about are going to be available to anyone who wants to use them. Um, we aren't going to be paying to build people's reactors. Though. So if, if a company is able to develop a reactor, you know, whether it's through some other DOE award or through some private funding, uh, then they would be able to bring that machine and test it at the test bed. There will be requirements on the types of machines that are capable to be demonstrated. So like thermal power requirements is a big one. I mean, we can't put a 300 megawatt machine in a containment that's only got 10 megawatts of heat rejection. So that's gonna be one thing. Uh, the source term of the machine is gonna be another one. If the reactor has you know, some huge source term that's volatile uh, and it doesn't fit within the envelope that the facility was licensed for then or authorized to, or then it won't be able to work there. But um, for the most part, I think anything under 20 megawatts with a reasonable safety uh, basis would be able to fit either in the EBR2 dome or in the zipper cell. Uh, what was the second part of the question there? Uh, how the DOE process, like the authorization process would be shorter than um, the full NRC licensing? Uh, the DOE process is, it's more similar to kind of the, the licensing modernization risk-informed performance-based process. And it's got several different steps in it that basically increment you into an understanding of what the, the safety design strategy is. Um, and it, I mean, it was designed around the idea that you were gonna be pushing forward the technology curve and looking at machines with less information, you know, data and science, to back up the safety basis case. So uh, we think we can utilize that to guarantee the, the safety of the operation, maybe not guarantee the uh, success of the experiment, if that makes sense. Okay, and uh, next uh, for Mark, Oakla recently submitted their license application to the NRC. 
how did they overcome the regulatory issues identified in your slide? Do you see uh, uh, more opportunities for streamlining the regulatory process? Um, yeah, well, I can't comment too specifically on the Oklo application. It's because I, I, I don't know all the, the details, but I do know that um, we've we've worked with them and the other micro reactor companies in developing our uh, the perspe industry perspectives on those regulatory issues in the 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 NEI, NEI report. So, so I would just assume that that um, their application is is consistent with those. Sorry, I missed my mute button that time. Um, the, the next question, and let's uh, maybe start with Alice again for this one. What kind of stories are we telling about this technology? Um, what would it mean for people to have a microreactor in their community? Well, as I, as I mentioned some of the use cases, um, this technology has the potential to really bring benefits to remote communities where electricity is very expensive, it can be transformative in that way. Um, we're also seeing cases where um, large grid disruptions from natural disasters could be largely in, um, uh, aided with the ability to bring in power um, on an emergency basis. Um, we've heard from the Depart Department of Defense applications where this kind of power can literally save lives in a very meaningful way. Um, so, so I just think the stories here are so compelling. I, I showed a couple of them in my opening remarks and, um, and I'm sure that as we bring these technologies forward, um, we're gonna have more and more opportunities to, to tell these stories, especially as people come forward to develop and deploy them. Thanks, Alice. I think that's that's a great place to close with that positive outlook on, on the future. Um, I want to thank everybody who attended. I especially want to thank our panelists, um, each and every one of you. I, I thank you for your time. Uh, thanks to the co-sponsoring organization, the American Nuclear Society Young Members Group, the NICE Future Initiative, um, and the IYNC, uh, as well as the DOE and E for their, their help in organizing this. Um, and, a, and a quick plug for my friend Susie Baker in Third Way for their nuclear reimagined art, which we used and uh, Alice used. Um, and we just want to remember, uh, remind everybody to uh, come attend our next webinar. There will be an announcement on that uh, going out by email, and uh, uh, there will be a, a link to register that goes out with the uh, a follow up to this this webinar. Um, that'll be on April 15th. And if you need to contact us, you have our email address and our Twitter handle there. Thank you all so much.